Praise the Lord. Turn to Judges chapter 7 for our study tonight. The word the Lord has given us concerns a very solemn concept. We're going to be dealing tonight with the word the Lord has given concerning evidences of preparation for manifestation. Basically, two evidences that you are preparing yourself for soon manifestation is really what we're saying. Now, in a message I delivered several years ago, which came by prophecy concerning God's end time army, of which Gideon's army is a type. We pointed out in that study, in that message, in that prophecy, I guess you could say, just how and why God chose only 300 out of 32,000. Now that's less than 1%. So as I say, if we had the time before Jesus comes, we could slip in a message that could make you jump over the back of the chairs and shout, but this is a message which means that God is selecting since that's a type of his end time army, less than 1%. Now this whole body could constitute a part of that less than 1%, so don't run off in all directions and fail to hear what we're saying, but maybe it's only 1% out of this body, or less than 1%. See, we don't make the selection, we're just giving you the basis. Why and how? Of course, you already know, I suppose, the Midianites have gathered. They're so numerous they can't even be counted. God raised up Gideon, told him to gather the people together. Then in verse 2, the Lord said unto Gideon, The people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, Mine own hand hath saved me. So we're talking about how and why he selected less than 1%. First of all, as we pointed out in that study several years ago, that If there are too many in the end time army, we're not talking about how many are saved or whatever. We're talking about preparation for manifestation to be used in this end time. If there are too many, they vaunt themselves. They tend to trust in themselves. You know, you can try to prove a lot by having all these seats filled, and most are. I see two or three empty chairs, and they're probably back in the nursery. So the temptation, first of all, would be to vaunt yourself. Say, look what we did. We proved we were right because we've got every seat filled, or whatever. And then another reason why and how he selects is verse 3. Now therefore go to proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. And there returned to the people 22,000, and there remained 10,000. Now, it's interesting. Over two-thirds of those that said they were following the Lord were fearful and afraid and would have been of absolutely no usefulness to God if the enemy ever attacked. Over two-thirds, only 10,000 are left. And I think you'll find it's still about the same proportion today in Christendom that in time of trial, over two-thirds will prove themselves unstable, unreliable. They'd be of no use in a battle, and God doesn't want his people defeated. That's why he doesn't select certain ones. He just passes over them. That doesn't mean they're not saved. These 22,000 went back. He told them to do that. If they're going to be timid and fearful and afraid, unstable, It's still about the same percentage, and you wouldn't minister very long until you'll find that two-thirds is being conservative, that are fearful and afraid. In time of trial, fear and doubt and worry, they've got to have counseling. They run to man for help instead of staying with the Word. They're not grounded in the Word. And then of the less than one-third that remained, less than a third remains now, most of them, in fact, 9,700 out of 10,000, prove themselves to be unreliable and unstable through a simple little test that God gives them. They show they're not prepared, they're not ready for him to send them anywhere. Verse 4, And the Lord said to Gideon, The people are yet too many. 
bring them down to the water, and I will try them for thee there. And it shall be that of whom I say unto thee, see, he selects, we don't. This shall go with thee, the same shall go with thee, and whomsoever I say unto thee, this shall not go with thee, the same shall not go. So he brought down the people unto the water, and the Lord said unto Gideon, Every one that lappeth of the water with his tongue, as a dog lappeth, him shalt thou set by himself, likewise every one that boweth down upon his knees to drink. The number of them that lapped, putting their hand to their mouth, were three hundred men. But all the rest of the people bowed down upon their knees to drink water. And the Lord said to Gideon, By the three hundred men that lapped, will I save you and deliver the Midianites into thine hand, and let all the other people go every man into his place. Of the less than a third that remained, most of them, 9,700 out of 10,000, proved themselves unreliable and unstable by a simple little test. Now, of course, as the prophecy came several years ago, and so tonight we want to make a spiritual application of Gideon's army, which is a type of God's end-time army. As the prophecy stated, I didn't know that until I got the prophecy. It was back in the 60s. And so we want to make a spiritual application. Now, are you aware that both the Word of God and the Holy Spirit in Scripture are compared to water? Both the Word of God and the Holy Spirit are compared to water in God's Word. Paul in Ephesians 5 speaks of the water of the Word. It's like water. Jesus in John 4 said to the woman at the well, if you knew the water that I had, you'd ask a drink of him, and he would give thee a drink, and it would be in thee a well of water springing up to everlasting life. He's comparing his word to her water that she's getting out of Jacob's well. He didn't have any water, literal water, to give her, but it's his words he's giving her about salvation. So the scriptures speak of the water of the word. Other passages would show that. And so the Holy Spirit in John 7, Jesus said, If any man thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. And out of his innermost parts will flow rivers of living water. This spake he of the Spirit. So there, the drinking of the water is really the baptism in the Holy Spirit, or the Holy Spirit himself. And of course, there are many analogies of this, like in Joel and other places where the outpouring of the Spirit is compared to the former and latter rain. We're always speaking about the outpouring of the Spirit, and of course, outpouring suggests raining, water. And so both the Holy Spirit and the Word of God are compared to water in Scripture. Now, remember, in Judges 7, God selected them on the basis of the way they drank of the water. And God, in this end time, here's your spiritual application that we're going to pursue tonight. God now, and has been, God now is making His selection for end time ministry and use on the basis of the way you drink of the water of His Word. God is making his selection, just like in Gideon's army, on the basis of the way they drank. It's not whether or not you drink. All of you are drinking. You've been drinking, most of you at least. We assume all here tonight have. It's not whether or not you drink, but how you drink of his water and how you partake of his spirit, whether you're satisfied with a taste in regeneration or a drink in the baptism, or whether you just want to be filled to overflowing with the Spirit. And they're not the same things, the baptism and the fullness of the Spirit, as we'll see later. So God even now is making His selection on the basis of the way you're drinking of His Word. Not whether or not you're drinking, certainly you're drinking, but how are you drinking? And the majority of people, I'm talking about Christendom now, which we're all in, but not limiting it to this church, the majority of people are like the ones in Judges 7. They partake of the water of the Word of God in, well, one of several ways, sometimes with a bit of indifference and shallowness and carelessness, and, well, it's faith assembly, it's another sermon, Brother Freeman again, or Bruce Kinsey, or Steve, or whoever, Another message, 
I'm saved, I'm under grace. And it's not that they're not drinking. They don't resist it, they receive it, but they're not drinking in a way that shows that they know what they're doing. And of course, some of these get caught up in the delusions, as the gullible do, because they're not grounded in the Word, as they should be. Others are partaking of it just the opposite, like in the parable of the sower in Matthew 13. And none with joy, Jesus said, they receive it. But because their life, their character, their stability is like a little shallow bit of soil on a rock, they have no root in themselves, and they spring up overnight. I've had people run up here. Maybe it's the first time they're here. They come from all over. God's sending me here, and they're just trembling and shaking, overcome with joy because of the word that's coming forth. Where are they in six months, some of them? Or when some deceiver rises up in the body and because he says, I've got a revelation, they follow revelations instead of the revelation they've already got. And remember, the two sources of revelation. Now, of course, not all who are non with joy receive the word are shallow. But I'm saying this is the way some people receive it, just the opposite to that cold indifference. Well, it's another Sunday, and I'll go to church. And it isn't they really mind, but they're not really enjoying the water. And this, you know, proves itself in time of testing why they're unstable, like the fearful and the afraid. They're not really getting the word. There's some people get on the front row and they're all eyes, eager. And because you're on the back row, I'm not implying anything, but I'm saying some people select the back row purposely in a spiritual sense. That's their interest. And when I went to a meeting... When I first received the Holy Spirit, I'll tell you, it was front row and center. I wanted to see what was going to happen. I was hungry for the charismatic message, and I wanted to learn all I could. I just wanted to absorb it like a sponge as quickly as possible. And people come in and, well, they're not opposing the word. It was just kind of ho-hum. They're no different when they've heard it than they were before they heard it. They're saved. They got the Holy Ghost. They can prove it and talk in tongues, but that's about it. But there's some, as I say, receive it with joy, but they have no root in themselves. And so where are they in six months? Or where are they in time of testing? Or where are they when a deceiver rises up? They're following that because they have no root. Jesus said they stumble over the word, their trials or tribulation because of the word. Others, like in Luke 9, Lord, we'll follow you wherever you go. But every one of them said, Lord, let me first do what I think is important, then I'll follow you. Obviously, they did not think the word he'd been giving them that they had been listening to was important enough to put it first. Oh, churches are filled with people. And they get in here, too, that put other things first. They don't see the local body as their life. You have no existence outside the local body. That's the word of God. Because you just happen to be a leg or a foot or an eye or an ear and there's nothing you can do about it if you're saved. And if you're in a local place and we need an ear some night to hear from the Lord or a tongue to speak what he's saying or a hand to help and the hand or eye or ear or whatever isn't present, you see, you can figure it out for yourself. And so... There's nothing else more important. But every one of them said, Lord, I'll follow you, but allow me first. Allow me first. Allow me first. And Jesus said, if you put your hand to the plow and look back, you're not fit to follow me into the kingdom. So people received the word like that. You know, they were receiving his word, but it was not important enough for them to drop everything and go preach the kingdom. How important is it to you? Is the question. And so many people like those in Judges 7 are not doing like the 300. Do you get the significance of why God selected them on that basis? They proved themselves to be soldiers, trained and prepared and watchful. Plus the fact they treasured what they were getting. Unlike the 300 who cupped their hands and caught the water in their hands and then carefully began to partake and taste and enjoy. You know, I like water when I'm thirsty, but I can jump into the creek or the lake and take a drink, and it isn't the same. Even though I'm saturated, I can just drink till I drown, but it's not the same as sipping that cold glass of water just a sip at a time. 
And unlike the 300 who were doing that and knew what they were doing and appreciating what they were getting and watchful. Amen. You see, if you watch a deer or a lion or he says like a dog, you see an animal, when he drinks, he doesn't plunge his head under the water like a lot of people to get all the religion they can at once. But he's watching. He's lapping and he's watching. And that's what the men were doing even more carefully than an animal, if anything, because they were standing with their sword in their hand and watchful. They were already going to battle. They knew the Midianites were there. That's what they're gathered for. It's not like, you know, we might spot an enemy someday, but they're there before them. Amen. Unlike those 300, why the 9,700, the majority, just like a herd of cattle, ran and fell down on their knees and plunged their heads in the water pushing and shoving and crowding one another. God's making His selection in this hour on the basis of the way that you are drinking of the water of His Word. The way you drink, not if you drink. You can be saved by drinking, John 4. You can receive the Holy Spirit just by believing and asking. He says, if you ask for the Holy Spirit, God will give it to you. But if you want to go on to deeper things, the fullness of God, and be used of God in this end time, it's how you drink. He's watching. And not everyone has a taste for this end-time water, this strong message of faith and crucified life. And you could probably name a dozen other things that some don't have a taste for that God is revealing in the end time out of His Word. Like the vision that someone related to me several years ago where I was called to teach the faith message that God has given us. Sometime later, after that meeting, a young woman related to me a vision that God gave her. She wrote it out for me and handed it to me and said, in the vision, now this wasn't an imagination, but a vision. She said, as you were there teaching the people faith, and you know, the people just seemed to be receiving it, most of them. You don't look twice in some areas because you don't know whether they're going to sleep or just need prayer or what, but... Most of them were receiving it, and so in the vision she said some weren't receiving it, the end time message of faith. And I saw you in the vision, you were taking a bucket of water, taking it around to people and offering them a drink, and most would just, you know, rejoice in it and swallow the water and enjoy it. The message of faith. You see, the message of faith is a key to everything. Amen. You won't even be around long enough to do anything if you don't have faith. You have to believe for healing, deliverance, protection, finances, and all the other. Or the devil will get the victory before you get raptured. I mean, as far as making you ineffective. She said, but some would not partake. And as they would look in the bucket and in the vision, she said, I saw what they were seeing. There was a dead fish in the water that you were offering them. And it was, you know, unpalatable to some because, well, a dead fish in a bucket of water, you don't want to drink out of it. But God was showing her something. Then she said, I saw their eyes. He showed me their eyes, and the dead fish was in their eyes. The ones who wouldn't drink, it was in their eye. They had no taste for the water because it was the faith message. It's what they needed, and they saw what they wanted to see. The faith message was not tasteful to them. That's what we're saying. God is watching how you drink of his water. And the vision and prophecy that Anna Schrader gave me in 66, right after I received the baptism, remember it had to do with spiritual water. I see you by a well, she says in vision, and there the Lord's talking to you. And it's a literal well where he will talk to you and a spiritual well. And you're taking out of this well spiritual water and you're pouring it down the throats of people who are languishing, thirsting, and dying, and they're coming back to life. The faith message. And of course, God will do it, but the prophecy said God will erect a monument of faith. A monument of faith. That's before I even knew I had a faith ministry, or there was a faith message. The prophecy came before the ministry to this. But I'm saying there again is compared to water. Some are partaking of it. Some see a dead fish in it. How are you responding to the Word of God? Will you turn to Matthew 8? I want to show you how another group of people responded to the Word of God that he was offering them. Matthew chapter 8. I'll tell you, friends, it's serious. It is a solemn, serious thing you are to consider tonight. How are you drinking of the Word? 
the water. Here in Matthew 8 and verse 28, And when he was come to the other side, to the country of the Gergesenes, there met him two possessed with demons, coming out of the tombs, exceeding fierce, so that no man might pass by that way. Behold, they cried out, saying, What do we have to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? Art thou come hither to torment us before the time? They know they have a time, don't they? And there was a good way off from them, a herd of swine feeding. That's pigs, of course. So the devils, demons, besought him, saying, If thou cast us out, they knew he could, then allow us to go away to the herd of swine. He said to them, Go. And when they were come out, they went into the herd of swine, and behold, the whole herd of swine ran violently down a steep place into the sea and perished in the waters. And they that kept them fled and went their way into the city and told everything and what had befallen the possessed of demons. In Mark chapter 5, you know how he just speaks of one of these, how he was possessed and delivered and clothed and in his right mind. So they told about that. But it's verse 34 that I want to draw your attention to. And behold, the whole city came out to meet Jesus, just like the Samaritans in John 4. But when they saw him, they besought him that he would depart out of their coasts. Now that's solemn. And it takes the Holy Spirit to show you things like that because that's just a story to most people. You hear about it all the time in Sunday school lessons and on radio. But here is the way that the majority of people receive the word or the water of the word. They wanted their pigs, not preaching. And the Samaritans, who are called dogs by the Jews, persuaded him to come into their city and teach them. And he did for two days, and many were saved. But here, rather than saying, what a demonstration of the power of God, these two demon-possessed men, no one could even pass by that way, come and teach us what a demonstration of God's power, they besought him that he would leave. Oh, I'll tell you, God will send you to places, and it isn't always... Places where they'll receive your word. They will beseech you to leave their midst. Amen. Don't have him back up here, one group said up in the East Coast. He comes on too strong. If they've never said that about you, then you're not preaching anything. And the Son of God, you see, he did just what they said. He departed out of their coasts. And people will sit out there, and sometimes for months or years, and then leave and depart because, you see, they can't stand those demons of denominational unbelief and deception to be exposed. Like one man said, I don't come anymore. Why, I ask, because of the death of the babies. And because you mentioned denominations. Well, any one of the two reasons will drive people away and beseech them to get out of your midst. That's their reaction to the Word of God. Some of the most solemn words in the Bible are over in Amos 8, 11, and 12. Some of the most solemn words in the Bible have to do with the Word of God and how people respond to it. That's Amos 8, verses 11 and 12. God is watching very carefully how you are responding to his word. And this passage concerns the plight of people just like yourself and other Christians, professing Christians, who claim to be the people of God but would not receive the word of God. Or they weren't appreciating what they were getting in the sense they did anything about it. They had no thirst for it. So Amos 8, 11, and 12, he says, Behold, the days will come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. It's the next verse that is quite solemn. And they, in that day, they shall wander from sea to sea, and from the north even to the east, and they will run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and they shall not find it. Now you would think if anyone sought the word of the Lord, he'd get it to them. Now he will. But he said, the time's coming when you'll seek it and you won't find it. He certainly speaks of all of those who 
receive the word of God with careless indifference or do not receive it because it's too strong. Oh, I'll tell you, friends, he's narrowing the line even finer and finer where before, you see, all he asks of you is to get saved and get baptized in the Spirit and come and sit under some true teaching. But more and more, he's saying it's not just hearing the Word, it's not just receiving the Word, but it's how you hear it and how you receive it that he's making his choice on that basis, just like he did here in Judges 7. He not only speaks of all those down through history from the time of Judges who partook of the water in the wrong way, they were drinking, but he sent them home. But it speaks of those who sat under this ministry, this faith message, this end-time faith message and then left because they couldn't ask me to depart their coasts. I was here first, but they left. And some of you word ministers, you know that's true. They have left your meetings because the word was strong. And in some cases, they invited you to leave because it was their house or their basement or their meeting place. We know it speaks of those but it also speaks of those of you who are left who haven't departed. You haven't stopped coming, but maybe some of you have stopped listening. And that's just as bad as stopping coming. In fact, it's worse. And God said the time is coming when you're going to wish you had this word because in one of two ways, he'll either remove you from the word or the word from you because you won't find it though you seek it. And all you'll be left with is the word of man which can't save or heal or deliver or do anything. It's powerless. Man's religious system and man's word, if it could save, heal, and deliver, that would be the way to go. We'd all be following that. But because it couldn't produce... Our hearts hungered for, there has to be more, I said, for 14 years. There has to be something else. And there was. In God's timing, we found it. Hallelujah. It wasn't that it wasn't there 14 years before I found it. I'm not blaming God, but in His economy. Praise God. If you're hungering and thirsting now, you can find it. But the time's coming when all you'll be left with is man's word. And it won't help you. It won't save you. It won't deliver you. It won't heal you. It won't protect you. You'll be searching for that strong word of faith that really chipped off the excess that shouldn't be there and molded and shaped and purged and pruned and hurt so bad so many times. But you'll be searching for that that word that will save and protect and heal and deliver, and you can't find it. Oh, don't treat it as empty words. God doesn't say anything He doesn't mean. He doesn't say anything He doesn't mean. The time's coming when a lot of people, a lot of charismatics are going to be searching for the faith message they're rejecting right now and they can't find it. So how are you drinking of the word week after week? Are you like the 300 carefully picking up the water so as not to lose a drop and then tasting and enjoying while you're watchful so that the enemy can't slip up on your blind side. You see, a lot of people get their heads stuck in the Word and they don't watch what's happening over here. He watches how you partake. Not just because you got your head in the Word, but how you partake. Whether you appreciate what He's giving you. Oh, I wish I could say it without sounding like we're boasting. Because we always get accused that we're saying we're the only one. No, we're not the only one. God help us not to be the only one. We want to see on every corner people who won't compromise the Word. But are you carefully partaking as the 300 did? The majority of the 9,700 showed unsoldierly conduct. Only the 300 showed that they were self-controlled men. They were thirsty too. It's hot and dusty over there in Palestine. I've been there. They were thirsty. But they put watchfulness before water and duty before self-indulgence. The 300, unlike the 9,700, were careful. 
They proved they had prepared themselves. The 9,700, like a herd of cattle, just fell down on their knees and plunged their head in the religious waters, as it were, without any concern for what they were drinking or what's going on around them. And God just passed them by. He'll pass you by with your head filled with theological facts. He'll pass people by who are on their knees praying like they fell on their knees to drink. You fall on your knees to drink of the Spirit. He'll pass people by who've got their heads plunged in the religious waters. We're not talking about salvation. We're talking about manifestation. Because he's watching how we drink, how we partake. Do we appreciate it? Do we treat every gem of truth as a thirst-satisfying drop of water that we don't want to let it slip and let it fall? Well, dear friends, there are people that come to Faith Assembly that probably don't hear half a sermon, half a teaching, half a message, too busy with other things. Some people surround themselves with the waters of religion. They're bowed on their knees drinking. Their heads are plunged under the religious waters. But they have no discernment at all about what they're drinking. They're not partaking of the word in the right way. That's why when some poison gets in the water, they can't detect it because they've got their head plunged in it. They've already absorbed it before they know what's happened to them. The Word of God is not something you just read through it to find out how quickly you can read through the Bible, how many chapters you can read in a week. That's man's way. You can get a certificate on the wall from Southern Baptist doing that. And then there are those who are content with substituting man's water, the water of man's word for God's word. They've done that here. That seven spirits error that cropped up here in our midst, why there were those who just, they weren't really thirsty for God's water that they were getting week after week from the pulpit, but it sounded like something tasty. So they followed that seven spirits error and some other things. And as a result, they don't even know what Hebrews 11.1 1 means. And then there are others who have gone out, and some of you followed them, and then you found out they were giving you poison water, and some left, and some didn't in some cases. But people will substitute the water of man's word for God's word because God's word's not tasty. And I'll tell you why they'll follow man's word, because he puts a little of his sweetening, flavoring, saccharin in it, and that's what they like. Oh, it tastes so good. He's got a revelation. Seven spirits revelation, they said. So they followed that one. Some of them are still deluded and hooked over that. Dividing the Holy Spirit up into seven pieces. That's all he was doing. So people will follow the water of man's word for God's word because they put that saccharine and flavoring in it. You know, a crown without a cross. No thorns in your crown. Happiness instead of holiness? Well, what son of Adam wouldn't follow that for the discipline of discipleship and trials of your faith and forsaking all? Why, well, anyone that was in his right mind would follow that sort of teaching or some new revelation. That's why it's grace when you partake of the water and pay the cost and show yourself worthy of being used of God. Only 300 are going to partake of this water in the right way. Now, I mean that in a spiritual sense. It's a small minority in proportion to all who are really saved and can talk in tongues and some who can't talk in tongues who are saved. Well, God will just pass them by. How would he be able to use a person who hadn't prepared himself? It'd be impossible. I'd like to see you operate a computer or fly one of these new jets without training. Oh, I wouldn't want to get on board if you announced this was your practice flight. God isn't going to use people that are not prepared. Only 300 will pass the test. The rest will fling themselves down to some form of religious waters and just abandon themselves to just soaking their hand in it without any discernment of what they're doing or what's happening. And as we've already said, one reason, one major reason God will not use the 32,000 and only the 300 is because 
they would just end up like the institutional religious system and start boasting of their accomplishments and their big structures and organization and not trust in the power of God. See, what God's going to do in this end time is by his spirit. It's Zechariah 4, 6, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. And the reason that he only wants 300 is because when there's only 300 of us, we know we got to do it God's way or we'll fail. Amen. When there's just a handful, you're either going to trust God to do it or you'll fall flat on your face. You just won't be able to do it because you can't do anything with 300 against the Midianites, that great host of the enemy that's out there. There are more demons out there in the air, dear friends, than there are people in here. Oh, by tens of thousands, great hordes and hosts of demonic forces. We have to have the faith message. We have to have the water of the word residing in us. Oh, yeah. I remember that time in Sellersburg when I was pastor of the First Baptist Church there. and The word was strong then like it is now. No different, except then I didn't have the Holy Spirit. But as far as strength, and they just would leave, and others would try to stay, and even the treasurer one time wouldn't even face me. He just brought the books, secretary and treasurer of the church. That's back in those days when we had those things, and just left them in the church. We discovered them at the next meeting. Deacons would leave. Finally got down to where even the one that was my closest friend said, it's time for you to go. He was afraid he'd lose some business. He was a businessman because the members were leaving. Over the word. I said, am I preaching the word? Is it that I'm not preaching? Oh, no, you're preaching the word. It's just too strong. We cannot live it. It's like salt in wounds. It hurts. Well, I said, then I can't help you. I can't help you. If it's his word, then I'm not going to leave till he says to go. So they called a business meeting, and there were many, many more of them than us. We had a little handful left, rattling around like we were in Winona on the Lake when this church started. I mean, a handful. You didn't dare count them because you knew they weren't over the number that followed Jesus. That's 11. You said 12. No, one of those was a devil. That's right. Read John 6. They all forsook him. His disciples, they're called, forsook him because of his strong word on election. Praise God. He said... Will you go away? And eleven said, we've got nowhere else to go. Well, that's about what we had. And so they called this meeting to vote me out. And a couple of the deacons, bless their heart, they didn't know straight up spiritually, even though they sat there and listened to the word. They didn't. One of them, while I was gone on vacation, tried to sell the building. Trying to sell the building because, you know, it was in the city where we were getting all of our persecution. We could sell the building. We'd get out where we wouldn't have persecution. You could tell he'd never read the Bible. <laughs> know where you'll ever go if you preach the word. You won't have persecution. And they were so zealous for the Lord's house, the roof started to leak. We were down to no money, and the roof started to leak. Instead of doing anything about the leaks, you know, you could at least put a little tar over it. They would just set buckets under it, and if it started to leak, they'd just move over and move a bucket. <laughs> you can see why it's dead now. It's Ichabod. But anyway, at this time, this was some time before they all gave up, they said, well, we have the membership list. We'll just go around and advise them of this business meeting. That church was known as the Fighting Baptist Church. Of course, every Baptist church is fighting Baptist, but this church did nothing but fight. From 1798, it was the first Baptist church in Indiana. And real old people who wouldn't come any longer because that's all they did is fight said, that's all we've done. When we were over here on a creek, had a little building over there, said that we'd choose up sides and some would meet for Sunday school on the hill over there and some would get in the church and nothing but fight. So he said, we'll gather these names and call these people and so on, and they'll come in and vote them out because though they don't know who you are and they don't come, they dislike one another so much, they'll vote for you just to get them out. Well, I said, no, that's not the way to do it. If they don't come, I don't want their vote. That's back in the days when we voted, too, years ago, which I didn't invent, but you had to live with it if the church called you. 
I said, that's not the way. I said, the few faithful we have, let's gather and pray in the pastor's study the night of the business meeting, which was a Wednesday night. So we were over there praying before the meeting started. The fight started. <laughs> and I mean it was a fight every business meeting. And I, of course, didn't participate in that, but that's all it was, just battling. So we were there praying. In those days, you prayed silently. You never prayed out loud. That wouldn't be reverent since you didn't have the Holy Ghost you wouldn't know to anyway we were there on our knees in the study praying and they came in just like a swarm of angry bees buzzing this crowd of people yanked open the study door and none of us raised our head we just went right on praying our silent prayer and they didn't know what to do with us because they'd never seen people on their knees praying not Baptists we were on our knees praying and they didn't know what to do with us. All, if you heard anything, was their heavy breathing, you know. And finally they shut the door and took their seat. Well, to make a long story short, I've shared it with you before. I don't know how God did it, but God voted them out. <laughs> All of these people that didn't even come, they were still members because their name was on the roll, came in and voted that crowd out that was trying to put me out. I'm saying, dear friends, we had no strength. We were a handful of people. That's why God wants only 300, because I knew if God wanted me to stay, He would have to do it. Everything was against me being there. I don't know if you know of a case where a church, and they're always kicking pastors out, where they got kicked out. Do you know of a church where the people, I mean all of them, all but the little 12 or 11 that we had, because that crowd that didn't even come voted them out. And then all of them that stayed made a confession of faith, and I baptized them, which proved the whole church was unregenerate, and even the eleven who stayed had to confess Christ. Well, what I'm saying is, God only wants 300. To use an analogy, He doesn't need this 1,500. He only needs 15 of us. Now, this whole 1,500, if that's how many is here, can be the less than 1% or a fraction of the less than 1% of all of them that He's going to use in this end time. But remember, Christendom is made up of millions. There are five, six hundred million Roman Catholics that all think they're going to heaven after purgatory. <laughs> and a lot of them are charismatics. Millions are charismatic. Well, let's come over to the Holy Spirit now. How are you partaking of the Word of God? How are you partaking of the Spirit of God? You see, God sent His Holy Spirit to enable you to speak in tongues. No. To do a twofold work in you and through you. And mature Christians are those who don't stop with the baptism or regeneration even, but allow the Holy Spirit to do a full and complete work in them. So the Holy Spirit has been sent to do an inward work and then an outward work. The inward work comes before the manifestation. purpose of the inward work, as you partake of the water of God's Word, the purpose of the Spirit is to bring you into a place He can manifest you manifest God's power, manifest you as a matured son of God, but manifest God's power through you. Now, his inward work, or the work of the Spirit, is threefold. That is, there are three aspects to the inward work before we get to the outward. That's regeneration, the baptism, and the fullness of God, fullness of the Spirit. These are three aspects of the work of the Spirit. The first work brings us into his kingdom, regeneration, the second work of the Spirit brings us into His power, the baptism. The third work of the Spirit brings us into His presence, the fullness of God. You remember the teaching in Old Testament theology concerning the temple, where the Holy of Holies is. God's purpose is to bring you into the Holy of Holies. Now, I speak spiritually. It doesn't mean you're not there already by faith. Three aspects of the inward work. Three realms of the Spirit. Life and power and completeness. It's like building a house. Even if you're not a contractor or a carpenter, you understand enough to know that you don't put the roof on before the foundation. So there is the foundation. Regeneration. The kingdom. And then after you build the foundation and some superstructure, you know, framing and so forth, then you put the power and light into it, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I mean, I don't care how nice a house is until it gets the light and the power 
It's a cold, dark, foreboding place. We're doing some remodeling of a building now, and it was not until they put the heat and the lights, the power in, did it really take on some significance. Before it was just, well, insulation over here, a two before there, chipboard in the ceiling, a light that didn't work, the switch wasn't connected yet. Oh, praise God that the foundation's there, you see. But the baptism turns the lights on, empowers you. And you need that. Christians need that. And most don't have it, by the way. And then it's after you turn on the power that you start putting in things like the roof and windows and doors and things. I'm talking about completing it, whatever you do to complete it. That's the fullness of God, completeness. Now, I had the foundation for 14 years. And then in 1966, the power and light company came and hooked me up to what I had been searching for and needed. That's right, the Holy Spirit hooked me up. I got the power. And since then, God has been working on the roof and sides and the windows, getting things in shape, bringing me to completeness. And it's as we yield to His work do you come into the fullness of God. Now, a few other things about this threefold work. They're different. You find institutional church Christians equating regeneration with the demonstration, regeneration with the baptism. They get it automatically, inevitably, when they're saved. But before you say, ha-ha, they are really ignorant, aren't they? Most charismatics stop with the baptism, regeneration the baptism, rather than going on to the fullness. But there are three different experiences in regeneration. According to John 3, the Holy Spirit comes. There's a quiet experience. The change, the fruit, and all comes later. You don't see that at first. People get saved all the time, and you don't know they're saved except they make a confession of faith. For the most part, sometimes there's some weeping and a little joy, but it's generally a quiet experience in the sense that it's an inward work of the Holy Spirit. But I'll tell you, when the Holy Spirit baptizes a person, it's not regeneration, it's demonstration. And they light up and turn on, and, well, that's what it's for. That's why you speak in tongues. If every one of us had a vision, you see, or a dream, or we're anointed with the love of God, or whatever, there would be no common way to know when the lights have been turned on. <laughs> but when we all speak in those new tongues, the sign and evidence of the baptism is the same, then we all know that it's happened. That's why God doesn't use 50 methods. You know, you run into people I have all the time. Say, so, well, I got the Holy Ghost because one night I was praying and the room lit up, one man said. I was anointed with joy or anointed with love. I always say, do you speak in tongues? Well, that offends more than it doesn't. I say, you don't have the baptism. One came and apologized once. <laughs> he didn't like that because he'd had this tremendous spiritual experience. Room lit up, you know, like noonday sun and the voice of the Lord came. Praise God, I said for that. That's a wonderful experience. When you get to baptism, you speak in tongues. <laughs> Oh, he didn't like that. And I think it was about a year later he confessed that he had been upset, but he got to thinking about it because that's what the Bible teaches and asked for the baptism and got it with tongues. And then the baptism after regeneration is a demonstration. Peter was saved, but nothing happened until he was baptized. When he was baptized, he put on a demonstration, Acts 2. You see this as you pray for people. I remember years ago, I just happened to remember this, a young girl about 17 came, wanted to be saved, and sat her down in a chair and talked to her and led her in a confession of faith in Christ, and no change at all in her expression. She just received Christ, and that was it. She's saved, sin's forgiven. Now I said, you need the baptism. That's the second step. Not to be saved, but you need it. Well, she said, I want it all, and so I laid my hand on her head, and she received the Holy Spirit. Now, the regeneration happened, but no change. As far as you could see, now, you would see it in her life later if it's genuine. You see what I'm saying? But I'll tell you, once you receive the Holy Spirit, her face lit up like a 
200 watt bulb and she began to smile she didn't even smile when she got saved but she was smiling now and out came the new tongues and where you didn't hear anything but a quiet little confession now everyone who desired to listen could tell something had happened and then the third thing the third work of the Holy Spirit is Ephesians 4 Romans 12 Galatians 2.20 the fullness of God Ephesians 3 and 4 Galatians 2.20 Romans 12 the fullness of God. This is where God is trying to bring us. And there are three levels of understanding in Christendom about the work of the Spirit. I'd say 90% of them don't know they need the baptism. All Christians know about regeneration, fewer about the empowering, and fewer yet about the fullness. Now, we've talked about the fullness of the Word in you. You've got to have the fullness of the Spirit because the Word without the Spirit won't work. I'm not talking about just having the baptism. If God just wanted to demonstrate and to work miracles and prove that He's God through somebody, He would just baptize us in the Spirit and start working miracles, which for the most part, you know, just doesn't happen that way. There's a period of growth and submission and crucifixion if you're going to be used of God. And so what we're saying is the three levels of understanding are not understood by most. Every Christian knows about regeneration. Few know about the baptism as far as an experience. And fewer of those know about the fullness. People laugh at Nicodemus. Christians do because of his ignorance about regeneration when Jesus said a man must be born again. He said, how can this be? How can a man be born again when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb? They say, how could he be so ignorant? And yet they themselves are ignorant about that second work of the Spirit. They wonder why he's so ignorant of the first work, you must be born again, and they're ignorant of the second work, where Jesus said, don't depart until you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But because you have that truth doesn't mean you see all of the truth. And the whole truth is the fullness of God. And the way to the fullness is consecration, Romans 12. It's crucifixion, Galatians 2.20. And God is trying to bring us into the fullness because that's his purpose in this end time, to bring us into the fullness of himself. And if you want to know why he wants to have the fullness in you, turn to Ephesians 1.23, and I'd like to share with you why he's so concerned that we don't stop with the baptism. Well, let's read verse 22 with 23. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. And God has put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church. Now look at this. Which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Do you see what the Spirit is saying through Paul? That we are his fullness. He wants us to come to the fullness of himself. I hope you understand without having to make mention all the time of the deeper life in the spirit book that there's something beyond the baptism. And God isn't satisfied with a person just getting saved or just getting saved and baptized in the spirit. He wants self to die out. He wants all of himself in us. Now we're told here in Ephesians that we are his fullness. So what do you have if you've got half of them over here and a third of them over here who just stop with salvation or with the baptism. And they're still living pretty carnal lives. No faith, no real witness, doubt and fear and all of that. You see, then, there's no fullness for him out of people like that. And to the extent that self is emptied out of us, can his presence and spirit and fullness come into us? And when his church comes to maturity, then that's his fullness. He died for his church. He loves it. But without us being filled with him, it's like a vine with branches without fruit. It's like a shepherd with a lot of sick sheep. It's like a head with a diseased, weak body because he's all of those, the shepherd, the vine, the head. And we are his fullness. We're his joy. He wants us filled with himself. And self has to go if we're going to be filled with himself. 
We can't overemphasize the need of being filled with the Spirit as well as being filled with the Word of God. You can have the Word of God in you until you can memorize and have memorized the Bible from cover to cover. And that's just theological knowledge. Without the fullness of the Spirit, though you've got the fullness of the Word in the sense you know it, you can quote it, and you believe it. Without the fullness of the Spirit, the Word is just the dead Word. It's the letter. Oh, yes. The Word needs the Spirit. The Spirit needs the Word. You can't neglect the Word. If you're not full of the Word, then the Spirit is limited in His work through you. You've got to be filled with it, and you've got to partake of it of the right way to be filled with it. But just a bare word won't do a thing. And that's what's the matter with the church today. They're trying to do something with the word. They think that all truth is something you can memorize with the intellect. You know, the fundamentalists. And if they got their doctrine straight and they can quote you a proof text that they have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that means they have it because they can quote a text that says they have it. But see, Pentecostals and Charismatics know that the baptism is an experience. That all truth cannot be apprehended with the intellect and the mind. Some truth has to be experienced. It's not just quoting verses and saying, well, that's true of me because I believe it. But you see, charismatics need to learn there's a difference between being baptized in the Spirit and being filled with the Spirit. There are people sitting out here tonight who are perfectly content with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Saved, filled with the Holy Ghost, but don't have the fullness of the Holy Spirit. The Word needs the Spirit. And the Spirit needs the Word. You see, just memorizing proof texts or listening to sermons week after week is not what we're talking about. We're trying to get through to you that the Word of God is called the sword of the Spirit, not the sword of John Doe or Mary Jones out there. It's not the sword of some denomination or the seminary or the pastor. It's the sword of the Spirit. And the Spirit needs His sword, which is the Word of God. But the Word needs the Spirit because... The Word is the sword of the Spirit, and the Spirit is the power of the Word. They have to be together to effectively do what God wants done in this hour. Don't stop with the baptism. That's just the doorway. As we do show in our book, Deeper Life in the Spirit, as the Lord showed men a vision, He showed me that the baptism is just like one of those doors. You've stepped through a door. You haven't gone anywhere. You're saved. You move into the spiritual dimension through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But he showed me how it was a threshold experience, just the beginning. And he wants you to go on to the top, on to maturity. So how are you drinking of the Word of God? That's our question. How do you drink? What are you doing with it? How are you receiving it? How are you partaking of the Spirit that God has given you? Listen carefully to me. There are people... It doesn't mean everyone in these long lines are up here with problems, but they're people who are not going on to the fullness of the Spirit. The Spirit of God has come to enable you to learn to hear His voice. Be led and directed by Him in your decisions, and so on. Because eventually you have to get back to Him anyway. And even if you come to me or someone else in the body, we've got to get back to Him to tell you what to do. Why don't you go direct? He's not going to be able to use you. Remember what my little four or five-year-old grandson said. Grandma, why are there such long lines to see Granddaddy Freeman? Why don't they believe God for themselves like he does? That's a four-year-old. I'm not sorry to share it with you. I just want to remind you again. There's no way to be in the fullness and in a position for God to use you unless you're filled with His Word, unless you're filled with His Spirit. And I'll tell you, dear friends, we've got to die out to do the latter, and we've got to drink properly to do the former. So why is it that people are still following delusions that rise up in the body? Now, don't blame us for that. That's Acts 20 and other passages. God says that'll happen. That'll happen. You know, if you could keep it from happening, you would, but there's no way. You want to put a lock on the door? Well, the ones you locked in, some of them would cause you trouble. 
Hello out there. You ever been a pastor? You know that. You wouldn't lock in anything for trouble <laughs> in some cases. So God is watching how you're drinking of his word and you won't be caught up in any delusions or errors if you're watching as you taste. Treasure what you're drinking. Don't treat it with, well, it's another gallon of faith assembly word and you carry it home and what do you do with it? Don't even look to see if you got a hole in the bottom. Some people lose it before they get home. Matthew 13. Devil snatches it away. But taste of it. Treasure it. We've said so many times, I don't know why we'd have to repeat it. If you don't think you should be treasuring what you're getting, what are you doing here? But you know, we've said that to people who don't treasure it and leave. We had one couple recently left, been here for years. Kicked one of the pastors out. His word was too strong. I don't know why they come. I don't know how they stand it. It is a reflection on them. Now, if they'd have come once or twice, then it's a matter of opinion. I'm right or they're right. You know, we can't both be right. But for years, that only reflects on them. Their unreliability, instability. What are you doing with God's Word? What are you doing with the Holy Spirit He's given? Some people say, doing with it? I didn't know I was supposed to do anything. Yes, you are. You're supposed to yield to the Spirit. Seek His influence in your life. Ask Him to put to death those urgings and appetites and lusts. And I'm not just thinking of flesh, but whatever it is that hinders his complete work in you. Whatever it is. Because he wants to manifest us. Time is getting shorter. It's not getting longer. It's getting shorter. I don't know how much time we have left. I'll tell you, I don't. It's almost more than I can endure to finish the building I started for my radio recording studio. You wonder if you'll get it done before it's all going to happen. Well, the problem with that, and it is a problem, some of you won't be ready. If Jesus calls out his army tonight, some of you won't be ready. And I can't help that. I can't change it. I just have to, in the final analysis, tell you that the time is short and listen to what I'm saying myself. But praise God, as long as he gives us another minute, another hour, we can do something about it. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Because he can do short work in you, but God help you if you're going to be among those who rise up and follow error when it happens again. God help you, because we've warned you. Night and day we've warned you. It just seems some are fated. They're really not, but it seems that way. That they are determined to be destroyed, deceived and destroyed. Second Thessalonians 2, if you want to be deluded, God will send you one. Father, we ask that the warnings will not go unheeded. What you've said before, you're still saying, help us to treat these end time messages with the proper respect and solemnity. For even as the Apostle Paul said, we are beseeching your people in Christ's stead to be reconciled to these end-time truths that God is setting forth. We ask this, your mercy and blessing, in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Praise God.